Um, so at this point, uh, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So first thing I'd like to do is just welcome uh, our new school board member, Kurt Spiridakis, who's here tonight. And he is an unrestricted resident uh, position and lives in Bath. So welcome, Kurt. Um, next, the reason I open this meeting once a year is to, uh, first thing we have to do is nominate um, board chair for, for this year. So at this point, I would ask if there are any nominations um, for, at this point for chair. I'd like, Jamie? I'd like to nominate Lou Enzel for board chair. Lou has been nominated. Any other nominations? Hearing none, do I have a motion, uh, a second to the motion? Patty, second. All right, all those in favor of Lou um, as board chair. Any opposed? Hmm? All right. Unanimous. So I'll turn the meeting over to Lou at this point. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for your support. I very much appreciate it. It's an honor to be to be the chair uh, for another year. Um, so we move on to nominations for vice chair. Do we have any nominations? Anita? Yeah, I'd like to nominate Jamie Dorr as vice chair. Great. We have Jamie Dorr nominated. Um, any other nominations? No? Then all in favor of Jamie as vice chair. That's unanimous. Thank you all very much, and congratulations, Jamie. Good to have you on board with the vice chair. Um, all right. Uh, let's see, five point out recognition. Um, just want to thank everybody uh, as we move into a new calendar year, which I always find it very strange. I think I was talk talking to some folks about this, uh, that it's in the middle of our, we do officers in the middle of our of our academic year, which, you know, I know it's because we all get, people get voted in in November. I'm thinking we probably should get voted in in June, but that's that's another discussion for another time. Um, so thank you for that. And yes, welcome, Kurt, and, um, and to everyone who was elected in the fall. Uh, I think, what was it, Patty, you were elected, right, for the first time, and then Anita, you were reelected. So uh, thank you all for uh, continuing, and Kurt, thank you for jumping in. And uh, um, we're very happy to have you on board. And um, let's see. Oh, and I just have to say, because uh, people were talking about it the other day, thanking, I uh, wanted to thank EB and, and the culinary kids for students for the fantastic snacks that uh, they provided at the last meeting. It was pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, it's just always, uh, it's like, you know, in the middle of winter and it's, it's comforting and it's warm and it's wonderful. And you could tell they took great care and it's just uh, just another ex shining example of uh, the great program that culinary arts and everything at Bath Tech is. So I want to just shout out to her and, and her students. Um, we are at approving minutes. Are there any questions or a motion to approve or any questions about the minutes from our last meeting? I move to approve as written. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second by Megan. Great. Any other discussions or questions about the minutes? All right, all in favor? Any opposed? No? All right, well, thank you very much. We've approved minutes. Um, any adjustments to the agenda? Anything that needs to be shifted? No? All right, we are at the public session. If there's anyone from the public who is here who would like to speak to address anything on the agenda today? No. I know Jason just wants to. He's just I can I can see it, but <laughs> he's like, <laughs> now nah, I think we're good. I think we're good. You're you're going to be up here and 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 right now anyway. This so we're going to do staff. Have uh, Patrick introduce you all. So we have some people here tonight to do a, a presentation for us, and uh, I'll just introduce them. But we have Mr. Libby. We have Heather Sinclair, who's a middle school science teacher at Woolwich. Roman Quinn, who is the district 
technology integrator. And then we have students, I believe we have Maddie Green is here tonight and Miles Whitfield is here. So come on up guys. And this is a digital storytelling project. And um, you know, I think Ms. St. Clair kind of um, had this connection before coming to RSU One, um, but I'll stop here and without further ado, hand it over to you, Jason. I'll see if I can get this already here. All right, well, thank you, uh, Pat, and thank you, School Board, for having us in tonight. Um, yeah, I'm very excited uh, just to kind of introduce this group behind me and share th what they've been working on this year. Um, as Pat alluded to, um, Heather came to us last year. She met with me probably about a year ago, actually, in January, after she kind of um, was with us for a few months and shared an experience she had had uh, at a previous district um, with uh, an organization called Meridian Stories. Um, and, you know, it sounded like an intriguing idea. She kind of kept reminding me of it throughout last spring, and I finally was able to connect with the director of the program, Brett Pierce, over the summer, uh, and he just kind of gave me more details about it, and I, you know, I'm going to share their mission statement um, as he shared it with me. Um, their mission through this project is to prepare students for the 21st century workplace by providing opportunities to collaborate, create, problem solve, and lead in the development and production of meaningful digital narratives that address curricular goals. Um, so if you take that apart, you know, the, the collaboration, the opportunities uh, to work, you know, not only what they do in the classroom, but uh, then to put it together with digital media, um, I think is the pathway of the future um, and it's really enhances their education. So. I kind of from there uh, gave the team to go ahead to start exploring that, worked out things with um, Mr. Pierce. Um, and then from there, we had to just figure out where to fit it in our schedule. Um, so we were able to offer this. Um, as you know, we already have the boat building. Or we already have the boat building in place there for us. Uh, this year, predominantly, it ended up being seventh grade students. So we have uh, 13 of the 14 students are all out of the seventh grade. So once we kind of got the year up and running, um, you know, that kind of created some curricular conflicts for, you know, our other classes with those 13 students away every Wednesday. So this became a natural fit. Um, so we've extended it. This is what we do on Wednesdays with all of our seventh grade uh, students. And then even the boat builders return at 1.30. So they still get a, a session too at the end of the day as a group. So they're learning these same skills as well. Um, and I'll let Heather talk more about the details. I do want to thank a few folks though. Um, Heather, I, well, I would just step back for a moment. The One of the true uh, strengths of this is not only for the students, um, but the collaboration that I see amongst the staff. Um, you know, Roman is here with us tonight and Roman has been with us every Wednesday since we started the project. And the real plan became, uh, kind of came together in October uh, during the professional development day that we had. Um, Heather, Theo, Lucas Wallace, Turner Houston, Roman all met for probably four or five hours that day just kind of hatching out the idea and what this could become. Um, so, you know, it's just a very true collaborative. Um, and then for the students, I just want to thank the students, in particular Maddie and Miles are here and going to say a few words about their thoughts on it tonight. But this is so engaging for our students. It's the world they live in. And it's just so exciting to be a part of it and to see what's happening. So I've talked enough. It's really about the people behind me. So, Ms. Sinclair, if you want to tell a little bit more about specifically what we're doing at Woolwich. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Livio. Um, and thank you all for giving up a little bit of your time tonight. I know how busy you are as budget season approaches. So thank you. Um, we uh, were really excited to offer some information about this. We had some really big academic goals when we set about establishing this program this year. Uh, and they really fall into kind of these four categories. Everything we do as teachers, we do to try to make learning as authentic as possible. And so this multimedia projects really allow students to increase both the choice in the way they're interacting with content, but also their engagement. They're even here, mostly willingly. I think Maddie was voluntold, but <laughs> um, it allows for some real technology integration. And that's where the gift of Mr. Quinn has just been priceless. So having these skills, allowing students to create a variety of creative digital skills but also to see some of the real world applications that come with those skills. One of the things that makes Wednesdays really fun is that I don't ever have the answer to their questions. Their questions are things like, how do I, and I'm always like, I don't know, ask that other student over there who just did it with Mr. Quinn. Uh, and that's really fun. It's fun for me, it's fun for them. It really increases a lot of engagement. 
the idea behind digital storytelling, which is sort of the language we're using for all of these types of projects, is that it's encouraging students to use technology for storytelling, that it isn't just regurgitating information, it's telling stories, it's honoring unique voices. And that's really what the good elements of social media and access to the internet include, is the ability to kind of hear those unique ideas. And then it's authentic group work. So it's students working together in small groups. They are relying on each other. There are these really frantic moments if somebody is absent from a group on a Wednesday where the other person is like, I have to email them because they were going to bring the thing. And then the thing gets dropped off by the parent, even though the kid is homesick, because there's an awareness of the need to authentically own kind of what your group is doing. Um, the logistics, Mr. Libby kind of alluded to the logistics. Uh, our regular, uh, the remaining seventh graders who are not in boat building on Wednesdays, there are 14 of them. Um, and so we collaborate, we join them together and they follow a, a rotation through their regular teachers. So they spend time with Mr. Houston, they spend time with me, they spend time with Mr. Lucas, but rather than being their traditional content, they're working on these projects. They also have a chance to go to art class during a regular Wednesday, that's their Wednesday special. Sometimes that's regular art and sometimes Miss Devon gives up some of her art time to, co to collaborate with what the projects that these guys are doing there. And then boat builders, when they come back at the end of the day and Miles is in that group, they have about an hour at the end of the day on Wednesdays to do a little bit of a modified version of this that also requires them to do more work that is independent and outside of the classroom. So they're kind of living up to that boat building responsibility of, you know, catching up on the work that they're missing while they're having that additional privilege. Um, I just wanted to add a quick picture of the dashboard of uh, the program that we do most of our editing in. It's a program called We Video. I don't know if you want to speak to it very quickly. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we use this program uh, throughout the district, so everybody has access to it. We have you know, extra licenses uh, that uh, everybody can have access to. The students really respond well to this interface, and um, everything is all done from their Chromebooks. So students can record right from their Chromebooks. Uh, in cases where students use external devices, like we have cameras that we bring in, all, all of that gets connected directly and, and all housed in, in one location. Uh, from the teacher standpoint, the program works really well for us. We can come into every single project just like this. This is a screenshot from our teacher's point of view. Uh, and we can see exactly what students are doing. We can pop in and leave feedback um, and we can return assignments with that feedback to have them kind of rework it and come back. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can have this same environment shared by multiple students. So that's how we've been doing our group work. So it's kind of like a Google Doc that everybody's in. Uh, so if you have multiple people working at the same time, <laughs> you're going to test, it gets a little chaotic. <laughs> so that's where the communication comes in. And it's really great just watching the students kind of delegate amongst themselves uh, what their specific roles in that project are. If anybody's done any work with iMovie, it's a little bit like iMovie, only more collaborative and, and hosted online, which is really nice. I do want to, lest we forget, draw attention to the fact that there are some clips in here. This is the <laughs> new mascot um, uniform that we have at Woolwich Central School. That's our, our Scratch the Wildcat. Um, and he's actually in front of one of our green screens. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. The PTA provided us with that uniform. And I think, I don't know, probably five or six seventh graders have been in him inside Scratch by now to do filming. Yeah, for, and then a, a couple more. Yeah, so it's been, he's showed up in some videos that you'll see in just a second. Um, as I, I think you might be in one that, you might, that we might see today as well. Um, so at this point in time, we've completed five projects and we're about to get started into the true Meridian stories ones. So I just wanna back up to the beginning of the year a little bit. Um, students began with an introduction. It was really just introducing themselves to we video. They had to record themselves they had to get over hearing what your own voice sounds like, which has been a source of much complaining this year because they have to listen to themselves and it's a deeply traumatic experience. Um, they kind of got the hang of using some of the recording and they got to dabble in Wii Video a little bit. Um, and then we kind of dove right in. So our second um, uh, activity was a self-portrait. This is a, a naturally occurring activity that they do in art class. And it allows us to get into our first student example work. Hopefully this is going to be yeah, as, kind of a oh yeah, we'll see how this goes. If we get feedback disaster, we'll get creative. Or if it doesn't load because it's in a building that it's not familiar with. <laughs> mm 
Um, so students naturally record a, they always do a self-portrait as part of their seventh grade art class. And this year we had them, I'm waiting for sound. Come on. We may not have sound. There's music in the background, I promise. Um, we'll skip to about, oh, that works. Oh, well, you get the sound through. You yeah. get a little bit. Um, so students always do a self-portrait in art class. It's a normal part of Miss Devon's seventh grade curriculum. But this year we had the students actually record the entire process of creating that and then sped it up into a time-lapse photograph. So if we watch for, I think maybe about 30 seconds, we'll get a sense of this is Emily Brown, another one of our seventh graders, um, working with Miss Devon's hands that were just in the picture on uh, producing this. You can skip ahead a little bit if you want to. There we get into the really good time-lapse pieces. Um, and they were really proud of this work because it kind of let them have ownership. You know, um, their self-portraits are a really important piece of, of, of their process anyways, and kind of getting to have this ownership piece. It was the first time they got to practice bringing in and out music, as well as bringing in and out some opening and introductory slides. And then our second piece is where we're really gonna turn it over to the students for a minute. Um, one of the next projects that we did was has, have students do a read aloud for books. Um, so they each picked a children's book that they particularly liked. Maddie's is in there somewhere. We'll find it. Um, they'll find it. Oh, there it is. There's Maddie's. Um, and they actually had to practice reading aloud, which is really hard unless you have younger siblings at home and you're good at reading children's books. Um, and this is a place where Maddie in particular got to showcase some of the more advanced skills. We're going to shush for a minute. There's the feedback. We knew that was coming. You will not fly today. You will not fly tomorrow. You will not fly next week. So in this project, what was really great is that students got to incorporate a little bit of um, what they've already practiced, as well as an element of narration. So you can see them uh, in this case, you know, why am I talking? This is your video. This is you want to say. <laughs> um, this one was really great. Uh, just the way that uh, Madeline chose to uh, frame the image so we can see the entire book. Um, I, I originally, when we were brainstorming this, the thought was that, you know, we can have kind of older kids reading to younger kids in this kind of digital format. Uh, Maddie also uh, has some at-home experience. She's someone who really enjoys uh, the good sides of social media. And so she was really eager to practice sort of some of the sound effect skills and some of the bringing music in and out skills. Um, and I'm hoping we can get you to read a couple of them. Can I read them? Okay, can I read? I'm gonna pretend to be Maddie, okay? <laughs> Maddie says, um, and for real, these are her words, but even says Maddie's words, um, that one of the things she likes about doing tech stuff on Wednesdays is because it's not just sitting there while teachers tell you stuff, um, that it's a lot more interactive, um, both with other students and with Chromebooks. Um, and then she really talked about enjoying the, how it's open for creativity, and then talked about how at home you enjoy filming. She actually has a GoPro at home. Um, and enjoys acting and then really gets into being able to edit pieces. So we're gonna get into some green screen in just a minute. Um, she likes to watch a lot of digital content and getting to make her own has been really fun. Um, and then one of the pieces that we've enjoyed about having Maddie uh, work on this is that she has some skills from before we started doing this. So her skill level is pretty high. And so it's been, um, I'm proud of my work because I have lots of skills and it's fun to open up and share that with other kids and challenge them to meet that level. Um, and that's really been a source of confidence. Is that fair to say? A confidence that hasn't extended to public speaking yet. But when, <laughs> right? Good. Good. I'm gonna hold on to that last one in case you decide. 
Uh, Miles, do you want to add anything about your read aloud? I don't think we'll pull it up, but just comment on the process maybe. Um, mine was pretty much the same as our other regular students, but mine was, I think, more rushed because I only have the last period of school to do the reading credit. So we had multiple online quizzes. Do you remember where you wound up doing your narration, your voiceover? Oh, yeah, I think I did it like outside. Yep, we wound up. It was really early. <laughs> there's been some audio challenges. There's There's been a learning curve. Um, I want to show at least two more examples. Um, a couple of these are from the first group project that we did, which we called Stories from Nature. Um, I'm going to team three. I don't remember. Four? I hope. This is the one we wanted. So by this point in time, students were working on their editing skills. They're able to add text into the videos. They're able to add music. They're able to add narration. And they're playing around with stop motion, which hopefully will be very visible in a moment. Oh, the sound. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is just their production logo. <laughs> We're not even to the video yet. Uh, the so, challenge was to tell something sorry. about uh, nature, to tell a story from nature. Uh, this particular group of students has an obsession with capybaras, so they show up a lot um, <laughs> yes. in a couple of the different videos. So at this point in the, uh, the kind of the progression of our projects, students had uh, learned various techniques and skills. Um, they were demonstrating the use of stop motion in the beginning part, so they were creating that. Uh, this group specifically created their own authentic music was lovely and they looped it too so the same person can be heard more than once in in there mm -hmm. um and then they created a script to kind of follow along with the uh footage that we're we're watching here. Yep. Um, about yeah capybaras because <laughs> the capybara obsession is strong um i think in the interest of time should we yeah. it? let's go to pbis so our final project um the pbis project has been the point where we're really starting to shift to some of our academic expectations. So PBIS is our positive behavior expectations um, system for Woolwich. And essentially, it has a lot of conversations about what our expectations are for students. And then what we what are some sort of unexpected behaviors is the language that we typically use. So the PBIS committee at the school for years has been wanting videos to go along with these PBIS lessons. And so we volunteered our students. Uh, to produce those videos, um, and then had to, with uh, Ms. Dimbleby and Mr. Libby's uh, strong request, was to have students only modeling good behavior, which means we needed grown-ups to be willing to model bad behavior. We may have taken over the December faculty meeting with Mr. Libby's permission and been really bad for a few minutes, and then we had a couple of Wednesdays ago where several of our PTA parents offered to come in for the day and play the role of badly behaved grown-ups. So they were super bad. Um, so you're going to see them in a couple of these. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and then kids being good. That's important. Yeah, teachers at a faculty meeting. Uh, <laughs> uh, Scratch has been green screened in there, of course. So our 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 wildcat mascot is, you know, thumbs down on on this kind of behavior. <laughs> You can tell who the naturally bad teachers are. Can you imagine teaching these teachers? Yeah. And then once again, we have Mrs. Sample and her beautifully behaved. 
aged students. Uh, so our uh, older students actually went down to some of the younger grades classrooms to record them being good. There was a lot of conversation about how we really need you guys to show us the right way to do things. No, so I just, I just them. well, this is how they are, right? Because that was you and Ella who were recording those kids, right? So there was a lot of kind of opportunities. Um, we want to show you at least one more because we're not going to pass up the acting skills <laughs> of our uh, PTA moms. We were actually able to arrange to borrow a bus from the, uh, the bus garage in the middle of the day for about half an hour. So we had a very clearly scripted system. This is, of course, students demonstrating what to do. So a little bit of the setup for this project, students wrote uh, storyboards and had plans, like directorial plans, so they were kind of calling the shots the day of. So the students who created this are actually in the background kind of directing it. Yep, students being good. <laughs> Cameron's face. Yeah, you can, I think, in the interest of time. Yeah. So it's the right way. Okay. It's just... So we're getting into the what not to do. <laughs> Don't push people off the bus. Uh, that might have been Mr. Good, being our bus driver. That is me crawling around on the floor of the bus. <laughs> we have very enthusiastic PTA parents. <laughs> um, so our next and final piece um, is to transition into the Meridian Stories element of this. Uh, that's what Mr. Libby was alluding to in the beginning, and it's the piece that we're the most excited about. It's the piece that starts to get a little bit more academic um, <laughs> in nature. Uh, Meridian Stories is a, it's a local nonprofit organization. It's based in Freeport. And the gentleman that Mr. Libby was talking about actually retired to Maine after being a Sesame Street executive producer for like 20 something years. And basically was like, why do we have kids in Maine with these amazing technological devices not being created? And so he's established this organization to present these digital storytelling challenges. And it's really about an opportunity for kids to do research around a topic and then present that information in a creative way. So uh, with Mr. Libby's support, um, we actually have a subscription to the Meridian Stories organization. And we're just now starting to transition the students over to that kind of an opportunity. Some of the challenges that they have available on their website are things like uh, sports casting history, where students are asked to learn about a historical event and then narrate it as if it was a sporting event. So the race to the South Pole as a soccer match or you know, something like that. Um, they have a huge library of challenges um, and all of those are designed to pique students in both learning their content, but also telling the stories that make that content interesting in an interesting way. Um, and I know we've taken a ton of your time, so I just wanna see if Mr. Quinn wants to add anything else. Um, I, He's I, awesome. <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, today I went to go see Ms. Sinclair uh, so that we can talk about you know presenting in front of you all today. And I sat down at one of the tables and one of the students was like, hey, are we doing the videos today? And I was like, no, sorry, bud. That's, you know, a little bit later. But that's just a little glimpse of the excitement that students are feeling uh, with regards to this project. And, and this is challenging work. There's these, they're all learning really new skills yeah. that, that they're seeing the instant value of it because they're applying it directly. They're seeing this is what we're learning. This is how I'm applying it. And we're able to incorporate you know, working with this team has been pretty, pretty magical for me in this new role, um, just so that I can kind of, I've been able to figure out how I am functioning with the team and seeing this team working together. 
we've been able to incorporate all the different aspects of, of all these classes uh, into a, a culminative project. And I feel like the students really value seeing that instant like application of what they're learning. And that's why this has been so successful. So thank you for bringing me on board. It's been awesome. Maddie, do you want to add anything at the end? Yeah. Has it been fun? Yes. Yeah. Are you enjoying it? Yes. Yeah. Is it something you might consider looking at, like the graphic arts program here in college, maybe? Yeah. Maybe. Miles, what are you enjoying the most? The possibility of this next year. Like, yeah. Feels like a college. Like a class. Yeah. 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 It's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, so that's it for us. We did want to ask, see if anybody had any questions that we could answer, but we're good. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Were there any questions before we let them go? Yeah, go ahead, man. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So it's like a like a TP foldover. Yeah. So they can hold it like a tablet. So we used a combination of Chromebooks. I also brought in just document cameras. We have a bunch of these IPVO document cams, so we use those uh, pretty effectively <laughs> uh, for editing. Uh, we have. I use a lot of stuff I could just find around. So we have a lot of uh, these, you know, headphones with little microphones. So we were able to get multiple kids recording in the same room. Uh, the green screen came from my office. Uh, so it's just kind of <laughs> like, what, what do we have? What can, how, how do we make it work? And it's been, it's been amazingly successful. Yep. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you did this on Wednesdays, on boat building Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. What and you mentioned that Mrs. Devin was helping out a little bit. When do you, when does the majority of the recording and the planning take place? I would say for the regular Wednesday group that Maddie's a part of, the bulk of that work takes place during Wednesdays in place of normal science and social studies classes. Um, Mr. Houston and I are missing literally half the seventh grade to go to boat building. And so we kind of got creative. Um, and so for the students who are there for the full day, the bulk of it is taking place during the day on Wednesdays. They are doing editing work at home and particularly with the read alouds, a lot of them chose to do their audio voiceover at home, quite frankly, because it was quieter. We've discovered there are not enough corners that are soundproofed. <laughs> so when you've got you know, 20 kids trying to do audio, it's difficult. Um, the boat builders are in a slightly different situation. They do most of their planning and collaboration in this frantic 50 minute at the end of the day. And then they wind up doing a lot of the like at home work at home, which is the intent of the responsibility of those of those boat builders. So mostly in school carry over at home. Because I'm also on the basketball team mm -hmm. at the school. So sometimes we have games on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. So I have to leave early from the <laughs> Wacky Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> and then go to a game. So there's a lot of the home game I have to like yeah. sometimes go in. So there's a lot of running out of the room going, I'll do the editing at home and they're <laughs> running to go to their next thing. But it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of student buy-in, which has been great. Have you guys had any like communication with each other in elementary school, like around like the event maybe or something like that? Because this is awesome. It is pretty cool. Like, yeah. I feel like one of the things that we've talked about doing is trying to find a way to showcase the work at the end of the year, particularly, and you guys are going to get a little preview. Um, the way Meridian Stories works is they, they offer ongoing projects that you can access at any time, but every spring they also offer a set of challenges and competitions. Those competitions are actually evaluated by professionals in the graphic design and creative storytelling world. And essentially first, second and third place are awarded in certain categories. So we're gonna offer to the students if there are groups who are interested in doing those challenges. Um, and I think by the end of the year this year, we're gonna have a body of work that we'd be very interested in showing to, mm -hmm. to other schools um, as well as to the community at large and maybe look at um, more buildings accessing the Meridian Stories mm -hmm. material next year. It's probably, going to be most appropriate for, I would say, like fifth grade and up, not that younger grades can't be doing digital storytelling work, but the Meridian. Yeah, it's hard. And the Meridian Stories challenges are very academic in nature and are really geared for upper elementary and older. But yes, we want to brag. Yes. In addition to your, to your question, uh, one of the things I didn't have time to share with you all is we have kind of put a website together just for archival purposes because we, we're not going to be releasing this stuff to the public, um, but 
in my role, I kind of have the privilege of being the bridge between all the schools. So my hopes are, yeah, I'm everywhere. everywhere. Uh, my <laughs> hopes are to utilize uh, that as an example that I can get in front of other teachers and hopefully at the middle school and get other, other people involved in a similar process because this lends itself to every subject area that, that we can point at. It's just a different means of delivering the information and engaging students. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Jennifer, did you have a question? It was yeah, a question for um, Maddie and Miles actually is that um, do you guys know the kind of the difference between if someone's a native to a country or someone's an immigrant to a country? Like someone is from some place, other person moves in. So you guys are natives because you were born with technology. You're called digital natives. And people of my age and a lot younger are called digital digital immigrants. And one's not better than the other. It's just that um, you guys have grown up with computers and understanding technology. So I'm really glad you're getting a chance to do this kind of storytelling because it's using the tools that you were you were kind of just born with. And it's nice when you're um, patient with older people who are the immigrants, the digital immigrants, because we have to learn it more like a second language. And you guys like just speak it because it's been in your life forever. So, um, and the other thing is, um, I really hope that you get a chance to just read um, non-digital books to the younger kids. One of the best things is for both people is to have an older kid in their classroom and also, you know, for you guys to hang out with them. It was a lot easier when everybody was like kind of on one floor, but I'm really hopeful that you guys still, even though you have to go down a couple floors, still get a chance to hang out in first and second grade and kindergarten and, and read with them because they really, really appreciate it. Yeah. You still do that? Like real world, like in real life. Yeah. Reading buddies. Who's your reading buddy? They have their peeps. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I, oh, Jay, I just, sorry, yeah, that's okay. I just wanted to thank you all for coming tonight, Miles and Maddie, especially because I know it can be really nerve wracking to stand up in front of people. So thank you so much for coming. I find that student presentations are my favorite thing about being a board member because I sit here and smile all night long. So thank you all. And a special thank you to the PTA moms that <laughs> go above and beyond all the they time. So and much fun. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah, that's a good. It was amazing. So. And there's more PBIS videos. So as that's we awesome. them up, they'll be on the website. <laughs> there you go. Mr. Quinn, if you ever want to see, you tell you what, <laughs> that <laughs> well, sounds like a new reality series. Thank yes, you. Exactly. Um, thank you again, all of you, so much. It's, it means thank a lot you for, for you to be here. Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, so as we move forward, um, committee reports, facilities. Yeah, I can give a quick update and then Patty, if I forget anything, you know, just chime in. But um, facilities committee, we had middle of December, we introduced Dennis Ouellette, who you met last week as our new facilities director. Update on projects. All of you, are, I think, are aware of these, but we talked about the Dyke Newell boilers being done, even though they're shut down in the old, this is the old Dyke Newell, but they're, they can be moved. Um, so the work has been done and complete on that project. The Phippsburg roof engineering report has been completed, but the roof, hopefully the installing of the roof should begin this summer. And then Woolwich Central Air, we're still waiting on some components, and that should be, again, completed by um, hopefully the beginning of the summer. And then the other two um, topics actually will ironically be on the agenda a little bit later tonight is solar energy. The group talked about um, the solar farm project, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the elementary school dis discussion, we talked about, you know, a couple different options that hopefully we may have in the future um, to look at what we're going to do with Dyke Newell, possibly combining that with Fisher Mitchell. Um, and so those were the topics of the facilities committee. I will add that, um, you know, I guess it's probably appropriate during this report is under facilities that, you know, the storm that we had last week, um, you know, I mean, it was, you know, that slush one, the rain one, um, we did have leaks. And unfortunately, we had four to five leaks here in this new facility, which is concerning, disappointing. Um, but Dennis is on that. And um, he well, he's already t contacted the contractor um, and to come up and look at the areas uh, very soon this week, fix the issues, and then also have obviously that discussion of warranty as well. And again, find the cause and fix it. And we also had a, a few other leaks, um, you know, at the Dyke Newell, the new Dyke Newell site, which 
isn't as surprising in certain cases, but we have addressed those as well and we'll continue to. So that was, I guess, the, the crux of the facilities committee back in December. Great, thank you, Patrick. Any questions about facilities? All right, thank you. Uh, student board report, Natalie and Caroline. Yes, so I've got a few things to report. We have begun receiving reports from Woolwich BMS and um, Bath Tech. So I'm gonna read the Bath Tech report to you first. This is from Abigail Reed, who is the young lady who presented to us about cosmetology. Um, and she said, lots of exciting opportunities have been happening at Bath Tech to start the new year. The modular home that students in carpentry are building was moved down the road so students can finish the work. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for the carpentry and electrical students to work together to provide a home for future buyers. The National Technical Honor Society has been working hard to start the first ever Spirit Week at Bath Tech which will be held in February to support National CTE Month. They're also having a Skills USA competition to figure out which students are going to the statewide competition. And lastly, during this past week, eighth grade students were able to come and visit three programs of their choice. She said it was an amazing experience to see the eighth graders in each of the programs and help mentor them in cosmetology. And one question I have before I go on to what's happening at Morse is whether or not you would prefer that we read these out loud or send them out digitally to have them read or both? Well, I mean, we want to hear from you in your own words, kind of, you can, you can summarize them. You don't have to read them word for word, but if you want to, I would say, have, get us copies, that would be helpful. So give it to us digitally, but it's good to review it again in your own word. You don't, words, you don't have to read it word for word each report, but just in general, what's going on. I'll do that next month. Um, but for Morse, um, this coming February, or this February 17th, Friday, February 17th, which is the Friday before break, we are hosting our very own international night, which is being put on by the International Club and the exchange students at Morse. And I think we already have 12 to 13 exchange students presenting about their countries. Girl Scouts are coming. It should be a pretty cool event. Um, and all of you guys are invited to it. Another event is the Morse Women's Empowerment Club is putting on a Women in the Community Gallery in March. And we have our opening night March 1st where we're going to recognize the nominees. We're recognizing 18 women in the community, um, including Mrs. Joseph. Um, and we're going to recognize the nominees and it's also an art gallery. So if you guys would like to come by and see that, the next it's going to be at Morse the following week. So that might be an easier time, but I'd love to show you guys that. Um, so opening night is March 4th, but it's at the patent free from the or the first, sorry, it's at the patent free from the first to the fourth, and then it will be in the Morse library the week after. Um, end of the semester was last week, I believe. So class rank is coming out for the seniors and NHS will be announced for the juniors in the next month or so. Uh, the library is doing a lot of things for Black History Month. They're going to be showing films throughout the month. And on the 17th, we're having a wear green to school in solidarity of Black History Month. Um, I'm going to move past on the line. Okay. All right. So Natalie pretty much dealt with all of the Morse things going on. Um, I guess one thing I would add is that winter sports season is almost coming to an end. I think by the middle of February, it will be over. Um, so a couple weeks ago, I had a meeting. Natalie and I are definitely getting more into gear with meeting with the younger school communities. Like she said, she's starting to receive emails. And a couple weeks ago, I went to one of the BMS student council meetings. And um, I just took some notes here about a few things that are going on. Um, so they're planning this group of, I think it was just a group of girls, they planned a ski trip on February 9th to Black Mountain um, for students that have little to no experience with skiing. And I think it was super incredible that they don't have, the students that are going on the trip do, don't have to pay. They've raised enough money, I think, to just have it be no fee for the students. Um, they also are planning on having an indoor yard sale as just a fundraiser. Um, they 
are trying to raise money for a Gaga pit in the recess area. A lot of them were complaining about the rather boring place they have for uh, recess. So they were they raised money for that by having a bake sale during the elections in November. Um, and some upcoming events, they are all hopeful for school dances. Um, some of the girls wanted to plan a Valentine's Day dance. And there's also maybe a winter carnival. And they didn't explain what that was in the email. But so, yeah, that's it for BMS. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your expansion of uh, all the school communities and really getting all the great information. That's fantastic to hear. Any questions for the ladies? Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, we move on to superintendent's report, Patrick. Yes, yeah, so we had two more students that recently earned recognition for their outstanding scores on standardized tests. Um, so senior Riley Dunn was named National Merit Scholar semifinalist for his PSAT scores, which were among the top 10 in the nation. And Riley is now in the process of moving on to the next step in the process. And senior Ruth Hart was the first student to ever earn the top score of a 36 on the ACT exam fewer than half of one percent of students who take the act earn a top score so congratulations to, to both of them uh indoor track uh caroline wouldn't be she wouldn't mention this herself but has experienced a number of individual successes this season to date and actually a few more records may have been broken because this was i prepared this a couple weeks ago when we were supposed to have a board meeting um but charlie thalen broke the school triple jump record shaylin brochu lillian parmelo bean belayed and caroline thalen broke the school record in the four by 200 meter relay and sarah Willette set a new school mark in the pole vault and Shailen Brochu again set another record in the 800. So a lot of fast uh, students on that track team. Bath Tech, uh, kind of mentioned, but I think we had over 300 eighth graders come through here between um, BMS and the other sending schools. Uh, and also, in case you're you know, you're interested, I think I have the dates right on here, but if you don't, I'll send them back out to you. But the Culinary Cafe is now back open for business. And so on Tuesdays, uh, breakfast on Tuesdays and lunch on Wednesday. So if you're ever in the area, um, please stop by. Just a couple other things. Just uh, Chawanki is now in our schools in most second grades doing the traveling natural history program and kindergarten with the study of owls. And Fisher Mitchell, Katie and I happened to be there on our regular scheduled Friday. And it was uh, third graders, you know, in participating in an inclusivity dance assembly sponsored by an organization called Spark. It's a nonprofit whose mission is to dissolve barriers and connect people with and without disabilities through dance. Um, and it was pretty neat to see the students, the teachers, and Mr. Berkowitz um, dancing on the floor and <laughs> everywhere else in the cafeteria. Uh, PES, uh, just the, the touch tank is there. We got, I think we have a crab, we have a lobster, and other species will be added to that touch tank that the students really love. And then lastly, adult education. Um, I think all of you know this, but in addition to the academic classes that we offer, to students that are preparing for the high set, which was the former GED, and also maybe tutoring and credit recovery that we do. So that's one part of adult ed, but we also offer a, a plethora of um, enrichment courses that are usually offered here in the evening at the high school. So one of them is ceramics, for example, and one of our teachers teaches that, and I think she has a full uh, class of anywhere from 30 to 40 students a couple times a week. And so Alan Lampert, the director of adult education, he's gonna be here at the next board meeting to kind of just give you an overview of um, the budget, but overview of what we offer for adult ed. And, and um, you know, and, and Deb and I talk a lot about this is that we're, we've been very pleased with the partnership that we've had with, with SCD 75 and Brunswick um, that, that forms the Merry Meeting Adult Education. And that's it. Great, thank you, Patrick. Any questions? I have one. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Um, you mentioned the Culinary Cafe, which I already knew about because Christina has been doing such a great job sending out the weekly emails. Um, and we're also getting those weekly emails from Jane Pratt at Woolwich. And I wondered, are they? Yes. So it, it just helps us yeah. kind of keep yeah. up on what's happening and see where we can volunteer or help out. Yeah. Are there other schools that offer those same? Yeah, I didn't, I guess that's on. That's on us as, as a district and, and, you know, me, um, you know, we can certainly get those out. I thought it was more in the past that if you were a board member and you, you know, you had an interest, um, you know, in another school that maybe your children don't attend. But no, we definitely can um, circulate those around and put a listserv. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Deb. 
Hey. Hey. So you learn something new every day. So today I learned that I'm a digital immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, huh? But you're very... What's that? I know. I'm the only one. But, oh, but wow. I think you're still very fluent in both languages. <laughs> Okay, so tonight we are six months into our fiscal year. We're talking about the month of December. Um, we've spent 48.17% of our almost $40 million budget. So it's uh, the spending pattern is, is basically um, consistent with previous years. This year's a little bit higher just by a couple of percentages. Um, Transportation is a little bit higher, and as well as operation and maintenance, and we've kind of kept our eye on that. We know that's happening because of um, hiring all our custodians, but that's working out well. Um, as far as revenue goes, we are um, the budget versus actual for tuition rates. The the tuition rates have been set by DOE, so um, I expect to see. Uh, a little over 200,000 more in revenues based upon what we had budgeted for a tuition rate. And also um, we have 15 additional students from what we had budgeted. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, investments, interest on investments is much higher this year than last. So we're already um, about $42,000 more than what we had budgeted for to it for revenue for interest. ARP, we are at um, about 48% with 51% remaining. So once again, that is the majority of that is the um, teaching staff and interventionists. And then we have the remainder of the uh, Fitzburg roof and a couple of projects, the air conditioning project. Um, other things happening in the finance world is the budgets are in process. Most everybody has um, their information into our software system. So I now it's crunch time for me bringing it all together. I've worked on the salary and benefits, but now I have to pull in um, the non-labor things and see what everybody's asking there. Um, we have an opening in our finance office. Um, and just a, a shout out, a thank you to Kim for picking up uh, the HR duties of posting all our absences. So that saves, uh, that helps me out a lot. And um, our wonderful Vita has come back from retirement, just like a day a week to do accounts payable. So um, that's really is about it. All the tax forms are out and filed with um, Social Security and the IRS and Affordable Care Act and all that. Um, so that's a picture of kind of what's happening in finance. Um, one thing that we did want to uh, let you know about is the Dyknoll, and I think Patrick's going to talk about this a little bit, the facility update, but um, as far as finances for the Dyke No Fire, we've spent about uh, $1.6 million um, on getting that school up and running, ref uh, buying all new supplies and equipment and that type of thing. It's in a special purpose fund so we can track everything that's happening with the fire. Um, we've brought in with the insurance about almost $7 million. And we have um, contracted with an insurance uh, adjuster to see if we can get a little bit more than that. And that's about it. Questions? Great. Anybody have questions? Jennifer? So we've spent 1.6 already. Mm -hmm. Is there a projection on how much like is still outstanding that we've all we well, what in? we're doing is anything that we spend over there, like adding fuel and paying the lease basically to the city of Bath, which includes all the utilities, um, is all being charged here because that's it's 
my understanding that a lot of that until we get settled where we're going to be, um, we just want to track to see what we're actually, it's actually costing us to, to operate over there. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Deb. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Um, fundraiser requests. Yeah, that's just an FYI in your, there was a spreadsheet in your packet. It's just for board members twice a year to know what is out there for fundraisers that we do. And, you know, we don't want to be, um, you know, we want to be a community that um, we want community involvement, but we don't want to overdo on the fundraising part. So um, if you have questions about specific ones, you know, feel free to email me and ask me. Uh, I can follow up on those, but I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. So again, it's an FYI. Yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. It's not really about the fundraising. I just wanted to, as I was reading the board notes from Phippsburg School, um, I saw a note that, 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 um, that they were thanking the ladies of the Popham Circle who had made a financial donation to the school. And I just, I really appreciate reading those things in the board report because it helps me understand how our communities are still feeling like their schools and their, you know, belong in their communities and how they can support them. So I want to just say a, a big thank you to the ladies of the Popham Circle for helping out the school. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, so you want to talk about uh, Dyke Newell update, old business? Yeah, I mean, Deb touched on the numbers, and if you have more questions on that, we can certainly go back there. Um, but I just wanted the board to know that we're, we've submitted two different, I guess I would say, ideas slash um, proposals to, to, to think about to the Department of Education and also to the chair of the State Board of Education. Um, and there is uh, something, not to be too technical, but there's a provision in Chapter 61 of the State Board Rules that talks about an emergency, it's kind of an emergency provision that they have for emergency cases, natural disasters, no, and it lists the different types. Um, and so, you know, we firmly believe um, that, you know, a fire to 60% of our building is, should be considered under this um, emergency clause. And so in one of our um, kind of ideas or thoughts was to ask them under the emergency provision for a certain amount of um, money that would follow the state kind of formula when you go to build a new school. So it's so much money per square foot per student, and that comes out to be a certain amount of money. And we would take that m amount of money and we would, by statute, we would, all, we would be required to also take the proceeds from the insurance and add that to that pot of money. And then if we did that, then we would then have to go out to a referendum locally to see if the communities would support um, the rest of the amount of money. Um, and so again, our thought, my thought process is, I think it's, in my opinion, I think it's short-sighted to just um, rebuild Dyke Newell and just a, you know, a pre-K to two and not be able to look at this more from a longer term perspective of combining and making one pre-K to five school in Bath. Um, you know, Dyke Newell was number 50 on the 2017, 2018 list and Fisher Mitchell was number 22. So um, just to give you a, a little background on that, is that list in 1718, I believe they funded the top seven projects and they're being worked on right now, they're being funded. But in 2024, they're going to reopen that application process and, and re, reshuffle the deck, so to speak. So again, we were 50 and 22 we may not be 50 and 22 next time, or number eight may not be number one next time because they have a team that comes around, you have to fill out an application, you get assessed based on need. So um, we're, our, our proposal would be that they would hopefully um, consider this you know, soon, so therefore we don't, we don't have to be part of that 2024 ranking system because that just prolongs um, the inevitable, so to speak. So that's one, um, thought process. The second thought process is go back to that. There, there are seven or eight schools that are already on the approved construction list. We've also thrown out the idea of because under the emergency provision that, that we be considered to be just automatically put on that approved construction list as the next school 
in the docket, so to speak. Again, we would not have to wait to 2024 to um, to start that process of, of visioning for a new school, building a new school, that type of thing. So those are the two things that we um, have thought about and we're in the process. We've had quite a few meetings with the Department of Education and the state board chair. They've been very cordial, very nice. Um, you know, and, you know, at some point we just need to get to a, 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 a see what questions you have tonight, but also get to a point as a uh, as a board as well to, you know, to support this one way or the other so that we can, you know, we need to advocate um, for what we feel is in the best interest of our students, our families and the district in general. So I'll stop there and just kind of see what questions you might have. Obviously, you know, 6.8 million is what we have received, what, we, what we've accepted from insurance. But you heard tonight, we spent 1.5 of that. Um, so we're talking about, you know, we've got 5 million and change to contribute towards this and 5 million is not gonna rebuild what we lost. It's not gonna come close to, to building what we lost. Even if we get another million or two from an assurance adjuster, um, you know, it's still, again, it's not going to be um, what we can do with this. So again, um, in that ranking scale, one would have to ask the question, if we did have to go to 2024 and do a ranking, um, I, I, you know, there was a, another school in Northern Maine that experienced a fire, um, but I, I just don't know how Dyke Newell School would not be, you know, near the top of that list. Um, so we're just trying to, again, advocate for um, speeding the process up through the emergency provision. Great, thank you. Um, questions? Go ahead, Jen. Um, I will go, go right out there. It's probably not too surprising, but I would highly advocate for a pre-K-5 school. If there's any, you know, if you're trying to gauge where we are in that, I would fully support that. Um, it would be interesting when we're starting talking about actually fi financing this prospect would be to know um, how much debt that we would have reti retired by then before we start talking about an another project. Um, if we have any debt that would be, um, still at Dyke Newell or at Fisher Mitchell specifically that, you know, any previous investments we've had, you know, having to be able to retire any of that debt before we think of moving them on. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting about the conversation about insurance because it would just be fascinating to know if our insurance is on our properties is actual cash value or replacement value. Most of the time it's actual cash value, which realize you can't rebuild for what the value of the building is considered at. Um, but there are policies that are available for replacement, replacement costs. So it's either ca actual cash value or replacement costs. So it'd be interesting if replacement costs wasn't something that we might look at at some point um, when it comes to risk management for the other properties, maybe like, especially this one. Um, and I, uh, I think that was, I think that's it. Thank you. I, I would definitely um, reiterate the support for combining the pre-K through or K through five. Would that property over there be large enough with ample parking to be able to do that? Yeah, I mean, we've done some preliminary, just, you know, our, our architect who built this building, you know, has come over, looked at the site. You know, we, um, you know, we did do some, studies over there just brief ones just because when we were looking for you know a site for a new school it's hard to come by in, in the city of bath but um yeah i mean building this would be you know i mean just the thought process was this could be a three-story structure um and um so yeah we'd have to do you know some in-depth but obviously the the current dyke new well, not the current but the the dyke newell site that we have um that burned that one is much more feasible for a project like this than obviously the fisher mitchell site Patrick, do you have uh, enough information to sort of make an estimate on kind of what the order of magnitude would be above what could you could you could receive from the state um, on the cost per square foot for for one school? Yeah, I, I don't. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I can share with you kind of just a rough estimate of what you know we have had some discussions about and it's you know for the model of this school so 250 students if you include pre-k um, times 140 per square foot foot times 500 total project cost which is what's being you know used or would be used in the next year or two 
Um, you know, I mean, that comes out to be about 18 million, 750,000. That's a rough ballpark estimate. So if you were to take that again, it's just an estimate, but if you were to take that and you were add, add another five or 6,000 of insurance cost, you know, to 24, 25,000, I mean, million, sorry. And, um, and then you were ta- if you were talking about, you know, what a new school cost would be, I mean, that's the type of, of, you know, computation and math that we'd be doing. Um, so again, we haven't, this is the, the piece about trying to at least explore the emergency provision, um, you know, again, whether that could be some type of um, idea like this one, or whether it could be one where we get on a state approved project list, where the financing would be a little bit different than that. Does that help? Okay, other questions? Discussion about so the next what's the so the next step i mean where where are we time timeline wise in terms of where are we waiting to hear from the state yeah i think or are we is it another meeting because i know we've talked about no i just i kind of want to get the pulse from the board tonight just about um you know to let you know we had those two kind of thought processes out there we haven't made like an uh, official kind of written request to the full state board of education to ask them to um to for their consideration or for their decision or for a meeting or anything like that we just have kind of approached individuals at this point just to kind of um discuss it um but yeah i mean ideally i mean if we had to wait till 2024 to do this list yeah, and then they have be. to they have to send teams down to evaluate every school that applied I mean, we're talking probably 2024, 2025, just to get on the list. And then you've got to build a school from there. And, you know, our, our staff and our students are in a facility that's that was made for high school students and was deemed that they needed a new facility. That's why they're here. Um, and so that's what we're trying to try to get to something that um, we feel is fair is not the right word, but that is um, appropriate. Equitable. Yeah, appropriate, <laughs> equitable yeah. based on that we lost 60 percent of our building right. and i realized that there's another school system in maine that had a very similar situation so um yeah i i, I certainly uh, understand that and um you know i know they're they're kind of taking similar steps to what we are doing and i so i think it sounds like um you know the board is very supportive of the most efficient as soon as possible method whichever one that is whether it's you know emergency funding and then we have to figure out if there's a gap in funding or getting on that list now that says, no, you need to fund us now and we need to be in that top six or whatever and uh, getting the money that way. So it sounds like there's a general, I mean, obviously we can get more detail, we can make this, but it sounds like in terms of a, writing a letter to the state, approaching it, all this stuff that you have our support to do what, what you need to do. So that if they're asking, well, what's your board think? And we're 100% behind you. And again when it comes right down to it before we you know submit kind of a formal thing we would certainly run it by you see if you have any well sure any any input in that but then um and then send it off so great thank you okay we are uh katie that's you're up on curriculum and on stuff like that okay so um as I shared with those of you who are at the budget meeting, um, for our math work for K-8, to our professional development portion of the project is done, and we are moving on to the technical part this spring, which means we're looking at um, our current texts um, that we're using, looking at what else is out there, and also coming up with a common vision and guidelines for every math classroom that's within our walls, which is really exciting. Um, I know Patrick and I have just shared a little bit about that we're having um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee starting. Um, It's starting in February. Um, Currently, we'll have um, 19 members uh, of the group that span all grades, um, different positions within the district and all of our schools, which is really exciting. Um, Those meetings will be twice a month because one will be focused on reading um, a text that um, was written by Professor Eddie Glaude. It's called Begin Again, and it's essentially about um, how we look at what's happened historically um, with Black and Brown people and how we think about the current state of our culture this week in particular, things um, that are just going on around us and how we kind of apply that to um, 
this community and to our schools and learn from that. Um, and then we're also going to be having um, the second meeting every month is is specifically about how do you create um, the most inclusive um, and equitable community that you possibly can. Um, and so we're starting with this sort of insular staff group um, and then we'll be adding in um, some students probably in um, the fall. We'll also have all staff um, working their way through a shorter version of this um, work um, that this group will help determine what that should look like and what the needs are. Um, and we'll also open it up to the larger community that RSU1 serves as well. So it's a really exciting project. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that our literacy work that we've been doing over many, many years um, to get things just right for um, students. It, we're finally adding the last portion in, which is the phonics um, component that we had kind of been starting to research what programming we wanted before the pandemic struck. And then two years went by. Um, and now we're it's actually ended up working to our benefit because um, there's a university, the University of Florida actually came out with this amazing program called UFLY, and we've been piling it a little and doing research on it, um, and we're going to start training our K-2 teachers on it, so we'll have a really sound phonics program. And I spoke with Beth Kayser this morning, and she's going to come to our present for my part of the board um, report in March and going to make you do a little bit of the phonics program with her and some of the math work we've also been doing with people and share um, about how her role has been going. So that'll be fun for you all. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to share, um, which I'm sure you saw because we've sort of publicized it a little bit, is that um, Maine's first ship, we received a $4,000 grant for um, our some of our fourth and fifth graders who are in the GT program to go and learn about some hand trades and history related to, um, to that project. And so that's really exciting. Um, in February for my portion of the board meeting, I'll have Amias, um, the main integrated health use survey data for you all to look at so we can have a conversation about that um, as a group. Um, and then we'll have Beth come in March. Questions? That's fantastic. So is the, the DEI that's going to be in, uh, I saw you sent out a, an email on that. Is that um, in person? It's in person. Oh, great. Yeah, in person for that's an fantastic. hour and a half for each meeting. Yeah. Okay. And I have your book in my bag. Oh, fantastic. Yes. I'm excited about that. Eddie, he's amazing. Yeah. He is an amazing. He was, he was my professor even. No way, really? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um. Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's much more, Katie. Um, Katie, when you bring in the Myas um, health data, could you? Um, it's probably included, but I'm kind of just interested in how our smoking and vaping rates are going. Oh, we'll look at that, John. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Especially um, in light of of some of the changes that have been made in some other towns to flavored vaping stuff, it would be interesting to see how we compare. You know, if our air, if our students are that impacts students or not. I'm really hoping it, it, we can see any part of that. But point, because I can um, pull together comparisons to with the rest of the state, which I think will be helpful. But yeah, for those of you who haven't seen the survey before, it, it is very, um, what would the word be? Comprehensive, Comprehensive um, and um, detailed. Um, and really ask kids some very personal questions. Um, and it's obviously anonymous and all of them take it. And so it's, it's really good information for us to have. Yeah. Great. Other questions? All right. Um, 14.2, uh, I think that's where we're at, right? Overnight, yes, overnight field trip requests. That's an, these are action items. 
yeah, I don't know if you have any questions, but it's uh, and for current, it's if we ever have an overnight field trip or out of state, the board has to approve that. And so this one, first one is just for the safe club to go to Camp Wavis and which is close by in Jefferson for a weekend and um, and then Bath Tech to go to their Skills USA in Bangor. So I don't know if anybody has any questions um, about either one of those. Go ahead. I just have a question about um, for this one, you can see the adults are teachers. So obviously they've been fingerprinted, but what are the requirements for like the Wavis overnight adult um, volunteer? Or is it a volunteer, I guess? Yeah, I, just... I, I don't know the details, but they would have a background check um, done. And my assumption is that they're they're staff members of some sort, but I'll double check that with, with Rebecca tomorrow. And they won't be taking bands. There is a cost for the um, the Wavis one, but there also is some scholarship uh, scholarships available as well oh, for good. students. Good. Are there questions on the overnight or the trips? Um, is everyone this this is action item, yeah. so we have yeah. to. Take uh, can we take them together? Is that okay? Hold them together. All right. Yes, we have a motion. Make a motion okay, <laughs> to approve to, those. To approve both. We have a second. Second by Jamie. Any other further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Unanimous. Um, thank you very much. So those are approved. Those are great. Both really good good events. Um, now the revision energy discussion, and this is an action item. And Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I have Andrew Carl that's from Revision Energy on on the line here. He's been very patient, or hopefully he's been doing something else for the last hour and 15 minutes. Um, but if you recall, I'll, I'll be real brief and then turn it over to Andrew or, or see if the board has any questions. That It was last year that we the board approved going with a solar farm approach, and it was going to be outside of Augusta, and it was supposed to be, you know, I think done in 2023, and we signed on for that with a 17.5% kind of discount is what I would call it. And, um, you know, with a for a number of reasons, that project has been delayed. It could be done in 2024. There's no, I don't think there's any guarantee to that. I'll let Andrew chime in in a minute. Um, and also that project, um, when it is complete, very well may that, that NEB credit discount offer of 17 and a half may not be able to be honored for, um, you know, for a variety of reasons again. And so um, they've offered us to um, sign on to the Pittston again, not that far from here. Um, so if we want to have classes that want to go and, and kind of do an educational field trip, it's still not a bad location for us. And that would be uh, all signs point to with permitting and everything that it would be done by the end of October of 2023. And so we would see savings earlier. And it's also at that 15%, which Again, if we wait for the other one, that could be at 15% as well. And so, um, you know, we've talked to our attorney who kind of specializes in this. We've talked with Andrew. Um, they drafted up a, you know, a, a vote for you to consider here tonight um, with those changes to, to Pittston, if the board is acceptable of that. I think the town of Brunswick, which includes the school department and your hospital, are the other two big entities that have signed on to this uh, Pittston one as well. And so... I'll stop there. Um, so for the new board members, though, who weren't here, so I think it was Kurt and Patty um, that, you know, we we had this discussion, was it last last fall, maybe, and voted on, um, you know, a project that we feel will provide save. There's no cost to us. It's providing savings to the district district over time. And you can see those two um, spreadsheets that I gave you or handouts I gave you in your packet. So I'll stop there. And uh, Andrew, anything you want to add to that before we open it up for questions or any errors I made? Uh, no, the, the great roundup, Patrick. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I guess I would just add to that um, that uh, some of the things that I mentioned to Patrick when I brought this to him in the first place, which is that when we were talking about this in sort of late 2021 and early 2022, um, one of the uh, sort of benefits of this project we were considering at that time in Augusta was its advanced stage of development. And so, um, you know, it's uh, a, a little frustrating to find that that project's um, progress has been halted. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these development challenges have sort of reared their head. These, you know, these issues that are, are arising for that project are not unique to that project. Um, you know, Central Main Power has um, just received a, an unbelievable flood of, of interconnection applications for increasingly large and complex projects since 2019. 
um, that, you know, f- frankly, they um, are doing their best with, um, but uh, it has definitely created delays, not just for this project, but for many around the state. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the legislature passed some, uh, uh, some laws that affect both of these projects uh, subsequently. And then, of course, um, we're seeing inflationary pressures across the board, as I'm sure you're dealing with in every aspect um, of, uh, uh, of school districts um, business. And so, um, yeah, so the good news is that we have this project in Pittston, which is closer. Um, and uh, that um, that project has a signed interconnection agreement with Central Maine Power, which means that the sort of that very difficult part of the project is now totally de-risked, um, has, has had a unanimous vote of approval from the Piston Selector, uh, from the Piston Planning Board, um, and also has a completed site law of development permit from Maine DEP. Um, and we are looking forward to starting construction um, as uh, Patrick mentioned, we've had um, two of our other large customers, uh, Town of Brunswick and York Hospital, have both, um, you know, accepted the adjusted terms to be a part of this project since it moved up to first place in the queue. Um, and, uh, and and we feel that the offer that we're making um, is, is very strong uh, based on today's market situation. Um, and, and uh, you know, really appreciate your willingness to consider it. Great, thank you. Um, are there are there questions, folks? Uh, Jamie, I told you last time I don't know uh, a whole lot about this, but I guess my one question is: um, Is there a chance that that discount offer of fifteen percent could be less, or is that guaranteed? Andrew, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So we're. Um, you know, we've provided and are negotiating a contract amendment that includes the 15%. Um, you know, the chance of the 15% discount for, of us coming back and saying we, we can't hit the 15% discount and we need to renegotiate it again. Um, it, it, there is a non-zero chance that that will happen, but I think it's a very small chance given the fact that we're trying to start construction on this right away, which allows us to, since we've got development tasks all de-risked, now sort of the main thing to de-risk is um, procurement of materials. And basically the last item that we need to complete before we can start purchasing materials is getting RSU1 into this project. And so the de-risking of that um, you know, is sort of the sooner the better. Uh, so I think that the, the chance of us asking for another change is uh, very, very slim. Uh, I live in the town of Woolwich and there was about a year ago a presentation and I don't remember if it was from Revision Energy or not because the town also uses Revision Energy for some other purposes, but there was a very substantial field going in off of Nequasset Road, solar field farm going in there. Is that part, is that from you guys and it, is that anywhere near, no? Okay. No, that's not one of ours, but yeah, on, on Evan Holbrook's land over there, yeah. It should be a good project, but I, I don't know who's who's doing the work on that. Yeah, one of the one of the things we've seen with the solar legislation that's that came into effect in Maine in 2019 is that we have tons of out of state companies coming in. And unlike revision energy, most of them are not vertically integrated. So you sort of have one company that like Evan might sign a lease with another company is doing the development. Another company will own the equipment and yet another company might be coming to give a presentation to the town of Woolwich, for, for example, um, to try to sell load, you know, uh, uh, in the way that we're discussing for RSU one right now. Um, and so it's a little bit hard to keep track of, of all these different companies. Great. Any other, again, this is something we want to be able to hopefully make a decision on tonight um, if people are comfortable with it. So are there other questions, clarifying questions needed before um, I ask for a motion? Do we need a specific motion for this? The one that I handed out, just the top part. You don't have to read the whole thing. The, um, the one that he handed out, if someone would be willing to read the motion, if you are all willing to vote. Jamie? 
Um, I move that the vote entitled vote to amend net energy billing credits agreement be adopted in form presented to this meeting. The motion, uh, do we have a second? Megan, you'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion before we put it to a vote? All right. All in favor? Moving ahead. Any opposed? Okay. It passes. We're going to do it. We are all set. Go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. So, yeah, appreciate it. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, so that's revision energy. All right, moving on. Uh, 14.4, approve board goals. Again, an action item. If should have received a draft of the board goals. And um, I know I have a couple copies here. No, I, I printed one at home and then you gave us one. <laughs> I should have, I have two somewhere. Um, so yeah, looking over this, uh, do folks have questions about what we have, the wording, any anything more specific that, I, I know you had had some questions, Jennifer, that yeah, looked like so it's- Yeah, so I sent around just in a, um, an addition, my, my focus on this part of the goals was of the pre-K number three, the pre-K programming. Yep. And um, and I'm not a wordsmith, so I was happy to, you know, get any kind of feedback that anyone else had. Um, what I proposed was a goal to utilize data analysis to determine the current barriers to education, education achievement throughout the pre-K to five grade span. Um, and the reason I was trying to implement the kind of a reference to data analysis um, one was so we have something to quantify for future um, budget expenses in mm -hmm. order to talk about the you know why we're in if we need if we see that we need to make more investments to pre-k5 how do we do them um, and I was also trying to you know round out the you know look at our academic success because we We've been looking at so many other, I think so many other things are important, but I also think academic success is also. And so that was just kind of the reason I came up with it. And again, I'm Can not you, a word could you read, could you just sure. read that again? It's, it's, uh, it's utilize data analysis to determine the current barriers to academic achievement throughout the pre-K five, throughout the pre-K to five grade span. So with something like that, I mean, is that, um, I guess I would ask Katie, if we had a goal like that with that kind of language, is that kind of data analysis, does it exist? Is that something that's easy enough to say, oh yeah, we can, this is what we evaluate for the curriculum anyway. So that's something that would be okay. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You would just. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that that's the kind of thing that would make sense because we'd be asking you, we'd be asking you for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, go right ahead. One of the things that I noticed in one of the board reports was I think Dyke Newell saying that they have a lot of absences happening right now. Would that be included in the data analysis? Mm hmm Right, because all that would be, you know, what what are the challenges, are the right? Barriers? You know, and if if that's happening a lot, if absenteeism is an issue, then right. that could be all part. And we could go over that in more detail. You'd tell us what you think is relevant. If you had other things you think you wanted in there, then we could certainly address it. Um, is everyone okay? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so, or is everyone okay with adding that as a bullet point? What about the other items? Any other um, issues with uh, just the wording or anything folks would like to be more specific about with goals? Or is everybody happy? Okay, it sounds like people are, are pretty good with where the goals are. So with that amended uh, line, then um, can I have a motion for, yes. I move approval as amended. Great. May I have some second? Megan? <laughs> okay, great. Um, any further discussion? No? Okay, great. Uh, all in favor of the goals as they stand amended? Fantastic. That passes, and uh, thank you all for that. 
So we're getting all this stuff done today. Look at that. Um, see what happens when you wait an extra week. All right. Uh, we're at 14.6 personnel items. Patrick. Uh, no, actually, committee assignments. Oh, did I miss committee? Oh, yeah, I, just, I mean, just to, yep, we, we don't have assignments. to have commitments tonight. It's just more of to show you where people are on committees right now and whether, you know, if you want to speak up tonight, by all means, please do. But if there's a committee you can't stand any longer and you want to change or if there's one that you have an interest in and you want to be added to, um, you know, negotiations is typically, you know, when the negotiation time comes up, which is next, next, year. next year. And we usually kind of do that, you know, through, you know, uh, meeting like this, but usually wait closer to the time. Um, but you can see policy, finance, and facilities on there. Um, and then down below, some, you know, ad hoc kind of committees. I mean, Bath Tech Advisory Board, we don't have representation from the other sending schools from board members. Um, you know, it meets quarterly. I don't see that as a, you know, one that we need to like jump on right now, or same with affirmative action. Dropout committee, Jamie, are you, you're on that, right? Yeah, okay, so I need to add you to that. Um, you know, Lorna was a legislative contact because that was an interest of hers for a, a little bit. Um, you know, so that's always helpful if somebody's interested in that type of thing. And then Anita, patent free, and um, Patty, we, we haven't met yet because we're trying to get some, a little direction from the state first, but that new Dyke Newell Fisher Mitchell School Facility Advisory Committee. So just any questions that you guys have or Kurt and Megan, if there's committees, you don't have to, again, you don't have to commit to one now, but if there's one that works with your schedule, that's why we kind of put it on there. I mean, we can change the meeting schedules if it, if it need be too. So well, any thoughts? I, I would be interested in the Dyke Newell one. I don't know if that's too redundant having two of us no. on it, mm -hmm. but, no, that's fine. Yeah. and any, um, yeah, I, I just can't do yeah, I the finance or facilities yeah. with my schedule. Yeah. It, the Bath Tech, I would be interested too if you feel like you need somebody. Okay. But um, great. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to find it, but I can't. Okay, that's all right. But I don't think you can change it. But does that the but, future of Thursdays work? I mean, months work for you? Think? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. No, it's a good one, and and of course, people are welcome to attend other right meetings as you're available to if you want to you know to something of particular interest that at that particular meeting but um it's just nice to be able to have a focus of one or two committees that that makes sense to you so yeah so it's okay we'll put you on there great and if anybody else you know in the next couple of weeks wants to change or wants to ask a question about a committee you're happy to you know meet with you and talk about it so thank you though okay great um thanks everybody uh personnel items yeah, just uh, we have two retirements. Uh, Tom Bedick, phys ed teacher at BMS, and like to thank Tom for 38 years in the district. Uh, and also Kathy McDaniel, who's an ed tech at Woolwich, and thank her for 37 years of um, service to the district. And then we have some resignations. Uh, Anne Marie Harkins, finance assistant in central office, and thank her for five years of service. Melissa Pickford, grade two teacher at Dyke Newell for four years and Alicia LaFosse, grade four teacher at Fisher Mitchell, and thank her for eight years of service to the district. Okay. Great. Um, okay, uh, next meeting date we have is uh, Monday the 27th of February, remember short month. Um, any questions before we adjourn? We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. And second, <laughs> got to be on top right to the end, Megan. Got to be ready. Um, okay, all in favor of adjourning. Thank you all very much. Have a good month.